good morning. morning. I'm so glad that you could join us on this beautiful first day of of spring. Uh, I hope it's safe to say that the end of winter is in sight, maybe. Uh, God has blessed us with the gift of four seasons, and spring officially begins today. You know, I always look forward to spring because that officially seems to begin the season of regrowth and rebirth and renewal. And it just uh, warms my soul. So how about a hooray or an amen for the sunshine? And <laughs> amen. Okay. okay, I have a couple of announcements to share with you today. One of them is that there will be an Easter egg hunt this year and it's only two weeks away. Uh, Joanne is looking for donations of candy or other small items that would fit inside an egg to fill the Easter eggs, uh, you know, those plastic eggs that we have. So you can bring your uh, contributions of candy to uh, the church and put them on the receptionist's desk if you like. So remember there's not much time. Another excuse to buy candy. Okay, we also have, as a part of our welcome back to Knoll Ridge, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but outside in the, uh, by the welcome desk, uh, there are, there's a rack of cards like these. And they are for the different ministries and program groups here at Knoll Ridge. And on each card, you will find the name of the person to contact for more information and a brief summary of the function of the group. So please take a moment after service to look these over and take a card of a group that you might like to know more about and prayerfully consider joining one of these groups because we need you. Thank you. And then, when you came to the Welcome Center to pick up your communion, you may have already picked up one of these half sheets at the, this morning. And so for the next two Sundays, Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, Missions Group is asking that you bring food items that can be presented at the Lord's table during the offertory time uh, in the worship service. The food donations received will be given to a local pantry serving those still suffering from the August 10th Duraco. If you didn't get a half sheet, please pick one up before you leave today, and there is a list of needed items on that sheet. So members who are watching from home, uh, there are some uh, uh, donations can be dropped off in the church entry anytime before 4 p.m. on Monday, April 5th. Okay. Would all who are able please stand with and pray with me? Heavenly Father, in the lengthening of days and snowdrops emerging from winter's frozen ground, we see the Creator's hand in the sight of a tiny lamb joyfully bounding across a hillside farm, we see the Creator's hand. Creator God, forgive our moments of ingratitude, the spiritual blindness that prevents us from appreciating the wonder of this world, the endless cycle of nature, of life and death and rebirth. Forgive us for taking without giving, reaping without sowing, Open our eyes to see, our lips to praise, our hands to share, and may our feet tread lightly on the road that we travel together. From your heavenly home, accept our prayers and praises that we lift to you during our morning worship. We pray this because of and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. From the highest of heights 
hearts to the depths of the sea. Creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring. Every creature unique in the song that it sings. Well, I know we're all happy that spring has arrived, and I, Roger was telling me that it's going to be 65 degrees today, so it's nice to see the warmer weather coming, and the signs of spring are all around us. Uh, Jill and I saw a robin uh, chirping at us uh, at home this week, so um, it's great to see, and may the warmth of Christ's presence be felt among us today, and what a joy to gather and share in the worship of our loving and living God. Um, this is our fifth Sunday of Lent, and next week, as Diana mentioned, we're going to be having a special uh, offering of canned food, uh, and we're going to have a processional where we'll walk up the center aisle and place it by the Lord's table for both Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, but we'll tell you more about that next week. But as we move on in our service, the scripture for today is Psalm 51 verses 1 to 12. And let's hear, the word, hear God's word. This is a psalm of David. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, 
So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. There are all kinds of posters that we see in public places, and they are designed to be eye-catching. Most of them come with a message that is quick to read and usually easy to remember. Some that we come across may have a funny saying, others an inspiring message, but there are also thought-provoking ones. There was a poster that caught my eye years ago, which had a clear, straightforward message. It simply stated, when you know something is wrong, nothing can make it right. Well, there's no arguing with that. All of us know. We all know when something feels wrong. We all know when something will be wrong. We all know when something is wrong. In our hearts, we know the truth. So that brief saying cuts through any excuses to explain away our wrongdoings. Once there was a young boy who found a pack of cigarettes on the ground and decided to try them. He went to a field near his home and after several fumbling attempts, got one to light up. It didn't taste good at all. In fact, he burned his throat and started coughing, but the cigarette made him feel very grown up. Then he saw his dad coming. Quickly, he put the cigarette behind his back and tried to be casual. Desperate to avert his father's attention, the young boy pointed to a nearby, nearby billboard advertising the circus. Can we go, Dad? Please, let's go when it comes to town. And the father quietly but firmly replied, son, never make a petition while at the same time trying to, hold, to hide a smoldering disobedience. None of us ever like to admit we've done something wrong and many will try anything to avoid facing their guilt. They will try to cover their actions by shifting responsibility and blame on something or someone else. One motorist stated on an insurance claim that he was driving along minding his own business when a parked car got in his way. Children, children can also play the blame game. A little girl was seen hitting her younger brother. When confronted with her behavior, she claimed, he made me do it. He wouldn't give me my doll. We cover up, hide, and blame. This happens in government and business all the time because that's how the world tries to deal with their guilt. When we know something is wrong, nothing can make it right. The problem is as old as Adam and Eve when they decided to eat the forbidden fruit of a certain tree. In the beginning, Adam and Eve enjoyed intimacy with God and one another. They were living in paradise with no problems or concerns, but God had placed a limitation on their freedom. God had told them they could eat the fruit of any tree except for one. That was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The account of Adam and Eve in the garden is one of the most well-known passages in the Bible. 
Genesis 3, verses 1 to 7, reveals they made a huge mistake when the serpent tempted them to eat from this restricted tree. First, Eve took a bite, and then Adam. Sudden, suddenly, they felt guilty. Suddenly, they felt ashamed. Suddenly, sin became a reality to them. Now, they are afraid and tried to hide themselves from God. Adam and Eve not only hid, but they also pointed the finger of blame. When God asked Adam in Genesis 3, verse 11, have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? He replied, the woman you put here with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate it. Well, that's the end of their honeymoon there. But then God turned to Eve and asked in verse 13, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Both of them tried to escape responsibility for their actions. They were saying, this wasn't my fault. God did hold them responsible for their behavior and they were sent out from the Garden of Eden. Like Adam and Eve in the garden, one thing we do try to hide from God is our sins. The truth of the matter is, it's a losing proposition. We cannot hide anything from God. When King David ruled over Israel, he reached the height of his power. David, the former shepherd, loved the Lord, but he committed a terrible sin and, thought, and brought many troubles upon himself. He had an affair with Bathsheba, the wife of one of his most loyal soldiers, Uriah the Hittite. After discovering she was pregnant, David arranged to have Uriah killed in battle. David had lost sight of the value of people, but those who knew what happened kept silent. Every, everyone thought David was untouchable as the king of Israel. On the surface, every, everything seemed like business as usual, but David was actually in torment. Deep down, David knew he had done something terribly wrong. In Psalm 32, verses two, three and four, David reveals what was really going on in his heart while he remained silent. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. His feelings of guilt were catching up to him. He threw away the laws of God. He threw away the sanctity of the marriage bond. He threw away his self-respect. He threw away a man's life, the husband, Uriah. He recklessly threw away and abandoned the person God called him to be. And during this time, God sent the prophet Nathan to see him. Nathan proceeded to tell a parable that David took as a word from the Lord. The prophet told him the story of the little ewe lamb and how the rich man took it from his neighbor. David flew into a rage and said anyone who committed such a cruel act should be executed. Then Nathan looked at David in the eye and said, you are the man. David was now aware that the Lord knew what he had done. His guilt drove him to confess and he wrote the thoughts that we now know as Psalm 51. In this Psalm, we see David praying for forgiveness. The heading of the Psalm reads, for the director of music, a Psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. The Psalm provides insights into David's spiritual recovery from a place of arrogance and callousness toward God's voice. His words are important for us to hear. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. He also asks God to cleanse me and wash me. And then in verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. 
David could look back and remember how close he once was with God, how God protected him as he went out to meet the giant Goliath, how God guided him along the way to success. Then as David became more powerful, he started looking after himself and lost his nearness to God. There is no joy in trying to cover up our own sins. First of all, we can't do it. We're not able. In my younger years, when I was about six or seven years old, I got my hands on a pack of matches and I found it quite fascinating to light a match and then blow it out. Well, I got more daring as time went on, and any sports card collector will shake their head when they hear this, but I got in the habit of lighting a match and setting the card on fire. And some of those cards today are worth in the hundreds of dollars. I was just burning money, but... Uh, Anyway, I'd let the card burn and then I'd blow it out when I thought the flame was getting too hot. So I carried on like this for a while, but then one morning I was upstairs in my bedroom playing with fire and as usual, let the hockey card burn, but this time I let it burn too long and I couldn't blow it out. And that gives us a picture of how sin works. You can flirt or toy with sin and get a kick out of it but then suddenly, before you know it, it takes power over you and controls you. You become enslaved to the sin. When I couldn't put the fire out, I panicked. I didn't want anybody to know what I was doing. So I put my burning card in the top drawer, tried hiding it in the top drawer of my desk, which was made of wood. Fire and wood's not a good combination. And I just hoped that it would go out by itself. Very shortly, the smoke started pouring out of the drawer, and I was terrified. At this point in time, I gave out a panicked yelp, and fortunately, my dad was just heading downstairs. When he heard me and came into my room, I just yelled, fire! So my dad took control of the situation and told me to get some water, and we put the fire out. But I'll tell you, I was one very scared, ashamed, and embarrassed little boy. Everyone in my family knew what I had done. My dad had gone into the bathroom and he called me in there. And I was one terrified, trembling little boy walking into that bathroom. My dad asked me what I had done, so I gave him the packet, pack of matches, told him the whole story, and fully expected to get a whipping. But to my surprise, my dad instead calmly took one match out of the pack, lit the whole pack on fire, watched it burn for a couple of seconds, then he threw it in the toilet and flushed it away. All he said to me was, now you know that playing with matches is dangerous. You've learned your lesson and don't do it again. And I never did. After that, though, I felt very close to my dad and knew that I could turn to him whenever I was in trouble and he would still love me no matter what. And it's possible for us to have the same kind of relationship like that with God. Like the smoke that came pouring out of my desk drawer, you can't hide anything from God. He sees it all. And make no mistake, God does not treat sin lightly. And God wants your heart, not your lips. I didn't go to my dad and deny my guilt, saying that I don't know how the fire got started. No, I, I, I acknowledged what I had done and confessed to him. I was honest and told the truth. That's the only way we can approach God about our sin. We can't take a light or casual approach. The fellowship we have with Christ is not restored until we confess our guilt. David was living in a way which life had become miserable. 
and the gnawing tooth of guilt was eating away at him. Guilt robs us of inner peace and harmony. Until we face guilt, think it through, pray it through, deal with it, and accept God's forgiveness, we are only going to hurt ourselves. Because of guilt, some people drink heavily. Some compound the problem with drugs. Some feel they are in a pit from which they can never climb out and dig themselves deeper and deeper into it. Every guilt-ridden person needs to hear and hear clearly the sure and certain words that deserve all praise. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Any time that we feel distant from God, it is not because he is withdrawn from us. Through his death on the cross, Jesus took the burden of, of our sins upon himself. And 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is why we call the story of Jesus good news. Our guilt can be taken away. There's a short little poem that expresses the heart's des desire of so many today. I wish that there was some wonderful place called the land of beginning again, where all our mistakes and all our heartaches and all of our poor sighted grief could be dropped like a shackle and cast at the door and never be put on again. As followers of Christ, we have discovered the one who understands, who forgives, and provides us with new strength to try again. Like King David, no matter how far we fall, it's never too late to turn to God, seeking his help and forgiveness. Many have hearts that are yearning for a release from the sense of guilt they are carrying. They need to hear the good news about Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that he offers. Only he can lift us out of the depths and put a song of victory into our hearts. Christ, Lord, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, the solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fear are stilled when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of Christ I stand in Christ alone who took on flesh of God in him, this babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. Laid here in the death of Christ, I live. There in the ground, his body lay, light of the world by 
Our Lord Jesus is the host who invites us to this meal. He prepares it for those who are out of faith, out of hope, and out of love. He offers food to the discouraged, confused, and the doubting. We don't come here because of any goodness of our own. We come because Jesus walks along life's road, finds us, and says, follow me. And we look back to that night when Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples. And while they were eating the Passover meal, Jesus took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat of this bread, do so in remembrance of me. In like manner, he took the cup and after blessing it, gave it to the disciples and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink from this cup, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink from the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you that we can come to you in our sinful ways and ask for forgiveness. This bread that we will eat helps us understand your great love and forgiveness. We realize it is symbolic of your son's broken body, and in his death and resurrection we are granted a new life. We lift the communion cup before you and remember when Christ was lifted up on the cross. It was to gather all people to you. Through Christ you have given us this community of faith, You've given us hope and a promise. In drinking this, this cup, we offer our thanks to you, and in eating this bread, likewise. We do this in your son's holy name, we pray. And as we continue to prepare, let us confess our faith. I, I believe, believe in Jesus, Jesus as the Christ, Christ the, the Son of, of the, the living God, God and, and I, I seek to follow him. him as, as my, my Lord and, and Savior. Savior. We will now partake of the bread and the cup.
at the end of the service, there are uh, containers by each door to deposit your used cup. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 17.1, it says, do not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or a sheep that has any defect or flaw in it, for that would be detestable to him. The fact that this command was included in scripture probably indicates that some Israelites were sacrificing imperfect or deformed animals to God as their tithe and offering. Then as now, it is difficult and expensive to offer God our best the first part of what we earn. It's always tempting to shortchange because we think God won't catch us. But as the sermon told us this morning, God knows it all. <laughs> so, our giving shows our real priorities. When we give God the leftovers, it's obvious that he's not at the center of our lives. Give God the honor of having first claim on our money, our time, and our talents. There is a container by the middle doors on the table where you can drop your offering off if you haven't already done so. And then would you pray with me? Dear God, we ask that you bless these humble offerings and that they be used for your priorities. Help us show our priorities to you by giving you first claim on our money, our time, and our talents. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's now prepare our hearts to go to the Lord uh, in prayer and hear these uh, words from Psalm 62, verses 7 and 8, which offers us these reassuring words. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. Let's now go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, ever-living and ever-loving, we offer our thanks for the gift of your extravagant love given us in your Son. Help guide and direct us with our eyes fixed on Jesus. We know that the journey of Lent comes to us as a gift. It is a reminder for us to slow down, unplug ourselves, and be still and quiet in your presence. Lord, it does take discipline for us to do this. We are addicted to instant access and immediate response. We are so used to being on that we have lost sight of our need for rest, renewal, and especially for you. So we thank you for the spiritual disciplines of Lent. We wait expectantly and patiently for you to speak and make yourself known to us in new and surprising ways. Help us to remember your wisdom that we may never doubt you know best. Help us to remember your power that we may never doubt the promises you have given to us. 
Gracious God, we pray for our church and give thanks for this building where we come to hear your word, where we gather around your table, where we sing aloud your praise and proclaim all you have done for us. We pray that our worship today may strengthen, strengthen us in our efforts to serve you. Renew those among us, Lord, whose minds are tired or bored or locked in routine. Help us to uphold them in prayer and by words of encouragement. We also pray for those in our congregation who are dealing with health problems. There are also many among us who have pressing needs in their lives and need your healing touch and reassurance right now. We pray that their faith will not fail during these days. As always, we also lift up before you those on our prayer list, and we pause now in silence to offer our own individual prayers and concerns before you. Bless and comfort each according to their needs and in line with your will, we pray. Merciful, forgiving God, knowing of your love in Christ Jesus, we confess our sins before you. We have again and again strayed despite our best intentions. Forgive us for the ways that we have failed you. Lord, we need your help. Help when we struggle to carry the cross of, faith, of Christ faithfully in this Lenten season. Help not so much to know what is right, we're aware of that already, but help to do what is right. Help to resist the temptations that come our way. We know that to carry the cross is a commitment to a way of life, but sometimes we falter. Help us in our travels that we might walk steadfast and sure and beyond to Jerusalem. As you forgive us now, may we see again the person and purpose of Christ. Grant us also through your Holy Spirit the ability to forgive any who have hurt or offended us in some way. We also pray for our world, lifting up before you all those in want and need. Reveal to us how we can be servants of your compassion toward them. And in this coming week, Lord, help us to walk with our focus on Jesus, following his example in our lives. Give us faith to risk a dangerous hope, to be ready to think as you teach and to act as you lead. We ask all of this in Christ's name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As God's Holy Spirit moves among us today, urging you to respond to the invitation of Jesus who asks, will you come and follow me? What an invitation to give your life to Christ. Through disappointments, trials, and tragedies, through all the circumstances of life, Christ will go with you. The journey of faith begins when you confess your sins, and then by faith receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Jesus said in Revelation 3, verse 20, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. He's standing at the door of your heart, knocking, listening, waiting for you to respond. And you're invited to, invited to pray along with me now. Dear Jesus, I know I can't save myself, so please forgive my sins. I ask that you come into my life. I want to know you and trust you. Amen. Jesus is welcoming you with open arms. Come and experience the joy of life with the risen Christ. 
Let's now stand together and sing our closing hymn. And now may your love abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen.